joined now by John Gosden. John, good morning. Good morning. And I would imagine you'll have been encouraged by some of what Nick was saying there. You asked it very much recognising the significance of the week ahead. And in your column, uh, in your piece that Lee wrote today in the, in the Racing Post, you're stressing really just how crucial this is. Yes, because, you, you know, it's rather like a quarterback in a football game scrambling around trying to get the pass away. Uh, you know, we're, we're trying to salvage a meaning and structure to the season. And I think if we do pull off uh, Royal Ascot, that will have been achieved. How do you think we've done so far? Well, very well. I think it was a slightly shaky start at Newcastle. Um, you can do all the statistics you like. You don't expect certain things to happen. But I think it got better and stronger. And the time we got to Newmarket, uh, right through that meeting, it went very smoothly. It's not often you run a whole day of two-year-old races and not have a single incident. Uh, all unraced two-year-olds. I thought that was incredibly smoothly and well done and I think it was wonderful the culmination in the guineas and uh, in two great races so I, th I think it's a pat on the back to all the participants and we are very strictly keeping to all the biosecurity measures and protocols so it's a lonely old place at the race course right now I can assure you but that's the way it should be. And just in terms of a, a time frame that you think would be appropriate for more people to be allowed into race courses, how, how front foot do you think the sport can afford to be on that at the moment? Well, we've always gone by government uh, instructions. You, you cast your mind back. The policy of this government in early March was herd immunity. Those were the terms used by Professor Witte and Professor Valence. And that is why we had the Premier League football games, why we have... Twickenham and Murrayfield filled the rafters of rugby internationals, why we had Atletico Madrid and 3,000 Madrid supporters coming into Anfield on the Wednesday, and why we had Cheltenham. I mean, that is why the government policy was that. Then in came Professor Neil Ferguson and Imperial and their team, and they said, if you continue with this, half a million people will die. Well, no politician is going to be able to deal with that. That's a suicidal note. Consequently, we had a 180-degree turn in policy. And we have gone into lockdown. Our horses had to be trained. We're out on the heath. It's healthy social distancing. We were fortunate. We're not stuck in a high rise in the middle of a city. But then when this date of June the 1st came for the possibility of uh, sport behind closed doors, it's obvious. You're on a 500, 600-acre site of a race course. You can most certainly have 152, 53, 50 people there yeah. socially distanced. And, uh, and I tell you, you sit in the grandstand and you look around and you think an atomic bomb's gone off. There's <laughs> no one there. So it's probably not, not beyond the bounds of possibility that racing can further a case that it should be seen not as a stadium, but as a park, uh, as a yeah, piece I think of parkland. Where, where I mean, I would... Can. Personally, I think for the owners, it's incredibly frustrating not to have, say, two nominated owners to come for each horse. That is really frustrating. They're the one to put the whole show on. Forget it. Without them, there are no horses. There is no racing. The race courses are empty. Um, so for them, it's very tough. And I would like to see ITV, it's a terrestrial TV channel, for goodness sake, have a spot at the end of the paddock at Ascot where they're socially distanced from everyone, but they can actually have a sense of contact with the horses, even if it's from 25 yards away. Yeah, I think I believe that is the that is the plan, though. Obviously, I can't speak for, for ITV and Ascot obviously has an enormous space in order to be able to accommodate people safely as well. And Nick's saying there might be up to 500 people there on any given day at any given time. John, I must ask you about the uh, row is putting it too strongly, but a, a disagreement has developed this week again between the Horsemen's Group and the, and the Racecourse Association about uh, prize money contributions and distribution. How did you view that? Well, you have to understand that the letter sent by the chairman of the Horsemen's Group is correct. We, the media rights income going to race courses, they were never transparent about it. They would never let the horse people, the owners, the breeders know what money was going in there. They, and that is not how you should run a business. It's not a correct manner. And consequently, unilaterally deciding without any consultation with the owners or anyone else that they can simply use levy board money and not put a penny of executive money in is wrong. Now have a meeting about it, show your figures, explain, fine, but don't just go behind people's back. And I'm sorry to say that 
the race courses are all going through terribly difficult times like everyone else, but we are nothing. The, the economy is shrinking. People have been furloughed. He'll never, ever work again because they'll be made redundant. People are facing difficult times. It's a time for absolute honesty and openness. And all we're asking for is to see their media right figures, and that's where the, it's very important that, that to know it from the onshore, offshore betting and everything else. And we're looking to that, and we'll also be looking to being very open with each other in the future. But I think when they try and do things in a slightly underhand manner, that is not the way to run this industry, and it is not the way that this industry will ever get itself on a sound financial footing. Does it sadden you that a spirit of consensus only lasts, can last about 10 days in this sport? I'll be absolutely honest. Uh, the race courses, the RCA particularly, have been a problem. They undermined Peter Saville. I was there on the ROA board throughout that time when he was chair right the way through. And they need to come and talk to us and be open with us and not just take owners for granted because our biggest problem will be if prize money remains low, 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 people won't afford to be able to play the game. And I made a little point in that article today that a lot of the major owner breeders who put enormous number of horses into training and then to often be sold and bought on again, look at the favorite for the Golden Jubilee, these people are not young anymore. You cannot rely on them to have five, six hundred mares and be putting these kind of numbers in. Where are you going to go? That's why I said in 10 years' time, and as we're careful, it'll be a very different land landscape, a very shrunken business. Race courses will go, trainers will go, studs will go, and we'll have a lot smaller and a lot less quality as well because you know what it costs to prepare and to breed and rear horses and the cost to run a stud farm. It is phenomenally expensive and it is a luxury goods business. And uh, that's why I think we're quite vulnerable unless we actually talk openly one to another. Uh, you've got some serious luxury goods on show in the next few days, John. Um, I, I can't go through all of them because time won't allow and you'll get extremely fed up with me. But I, I did want to ask you about, about Stradivarius and about Thursday and about how you feel that preparation has gone. Well, yes, look, it's, it's not ideal. It's not ideal for anyone. I, I didn't really want to run him in a two-and-a-half-mile Ascot Gold Cup Group 1 without a prep. We went down the road. We didn't go to Newcastle for the Cigaro and the Group 3. We went down the road to the Coronation Cup, where <laughs> they've never been so fast over that heath in 350 years and breaking track records. I think he equaled the track record. So it's not what you call exactly your cosy little prep race. No. Uh, he seems to have taken it very well. You always worry about the bounce factor when you're bringing horses back quickly. That has to be a realistic concern. But we've been very happy with him. He's, he's a wonderful attitude. I got respect for the field. I think Technician is a horse that's underrated. I was most impressed with him in, in uh, France last year. I wouldn't want to see too much rain and a big thunderstorm because this is a real fast ground horse and uh, he really doesn't like, he battles in soft ground, but it's not his seat. He, he can't show that superb turn of foot on softer ground. So look, if it's, uh, if it's decent ground, we're going to be there and it's a great testament to the horse trying to do that, something that Cigaro himself did. And, and we, do, we enjoyed a, a fantastic uh, uh, ask a preview that, that you participated in for Racing Welfare on, on Thursday evening. So thanks to everyone who, who supported that. And I, I could pray see what you said there. You gave a big shout to, to Nazif and to Palace Pier and to, and to Lord North and Terra Bellum in the, in the Queen Anne as well and, and frankly Darling. But you unleashed another um, potential star yesterday in Franconia at, at Newbury. And um, just the way that so for Frankie's expression, if you like, as he, as he attempted to pull her up, I, I thought was quite revealing. Yeah, she's very talented, Philly. But it's, again, she's missed running in April and May. So she's not seasoned yet. So I, I'm favouring to go to the Musadora, but we'll see what happens. Concerning the ones that we were having a jolly time promoting, yeah. I assure you, but when you enter them initially, <laughs> you're very confident. <laughs> and then as you get closer to the race, you look at the competition, you look at the draw, you look at this. By the time you get to the race, you are mentally sort of feel you're lucky to be there. So I've not got enormous confidence in them. I have confidence they'll run well, whether they're good enough is another matter. But I did roll Lord North into the Prince of Wales today, so the old boy's probably a bit confused with me already. Yeah, Lord North in the Prince of Wales as well. So, um, uh, and Medea as well in the Prince of Wales? Yeah, she's yeah. in there, and it's interesting. I, I, don't, uh, I thought it might be a blistering pace. Who knows what's going to happen? But it's a small, I think, six, seven horse field, so I thought Lord North can go there rather than carry a penalty elsewhere. Look, it's a wonderful race to run in, and uh, 
I think from the point of view of some of the other races, some don't get into the races, some will switch. It's playing a game of cards and quite frankly shuffling a fact that uh, there'll be a lot of races we're not even got a contestant in. But if you can manage to pull a brace of winners at the, the, the Ascot meeting, you've got to be happy. And you had a bit of fun with me the other night because you you put Chuck the curveball in with Run Run Wild in the in the um, in the coronation stakes. Yes, that was very much coming from uh, the wonderfully sporting uh, syndicate that owner and uh, Oshi, and I thought it was the most, I, I think I sometimes have bold ideas, but I just loved it. I just thought it was so off the wall that it was actually a good idea, so I'm fully behind it. Excellent. And Oshin, of course, can't ride her because he has to ride. He's committed to, to Graham Motion's Philly sharing. Absolutely, he is indeed. Yep. So, so for, I'm guessing Frankie will, will ride. I'm not sure who will get on at the moment. I haven't got that far. I'll wait for my instructions from this very, very enthusiastic group of owners. OK, all right. Well, we look forward to seeing that. John, thanks so much for your time. All righty. Bye. John Garson there. Um, amazing how he can so deftly uh, switch between the joys of Royal Asker and the, some of the dark places that, that, that racing has to go to to get its house in order. Yeah, he he was described by Joe Minasida as racing's best politician and diplomat and a profile. Um, Peter Thomas did on, on John last year and it was interesting when he when he was speaking in this in this racing post interview today, how we I, I put to him, you know, do, do you embrace this this role you have as the sage voice of racing? And he was saying, Well, uh, not necessarily really, but but he, he thinks that doing it behind the scenes mm -hmm is the most important thing. Right. And I think you, you do sense that with the resumption, and even things like the ITV deal, that he has been active behind the scenes in speaking to people and trying to, to press upon them the importance of certain matters. Yeah, it was a, most interesting to listen to, to John's thoughts there on, the, on what is brewing now, I think, again, between the, the Horsemen's Group and the Racecourse Association.